Hello and welcome once again to our worship from the Rosendale Methodist Circuit. Once again it's good to be with you and a special hello to, to those of you who are still shielding at home. You're not forgotten, that's for sure. And also to those of you recovering from operations, as I know there's one or two of you doing that, and some who are still waiting for operations. So please remember that we're thinking of you in our prayers and uh, don't despair. We're going to begin this morning's worship by thinking about the cosmos. Those of you who've seen pictures from the Hubble telescope will know how wonderful they are, how beautiful the, the, the pictures they paint of the heavens. Um, we're into Psalm 19, God's glory in creation. Just the first few verses and then the last verse. Uh, so just imagine, if you will, picture in your mind's eye the, the wonder of the, of the heavens. Let, let the psalmist paint a picture for you as well. The heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech nor are their words, their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the ends of the earth, from the ends of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them and nothing is hidden from its heat. So the sun and the stars and the moon, the psalmist just paints this picture of God's glory as, uh, as he sees it in the heavens above. And if you get a chance at any point to find a place which is really dark on a clear night, you know, no moon, no light pollution, just look up at the heavens and see the Milky Way. Beautiful. And then the final verse of Psalm 19 says this, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. And to carry on that theme of creation, uh, one of our first songs is, All heaven declares the glory of the risen Lord. All heaven, heaven declares the glory of the risen Lord. And then, just to bring it down a little bit as we move into our prayers, there's a quiet understanding. When we gather together in God's presence, there's that wonderful sense, isn't there, of God being with us. So as we recognise God with us, here's a prayer taken from the act of prayer by John Birch. And we start by addressing God as our creator. So let us pray. Creator of a universe beyond imagining, yet close enough to hear a whispered prayer and hold an outstretched hand. This is our God. And we join the heavenly chorus, joyfully declaring that those who seek will find, and those who find will know such love and grace beyond imagining. This is our God. Lord Jesus, you willingly walked the path laid out for you, striding purposefully toward Jerusalem and a crowd that cried, Crucify! Forgive us who hesitate along the road when our stride shortens and our faith is challenged as we glance toward the cross. Grant us courage and perseverance as we journey with you, for we cannot do it in our strength alone. By faith we know you created us for a purpose, Love us unconditionally, call us to follow you, and forgive us when we fail you. Raise us up when we stumble, and bless us in your service. Thank you that your promises are always true, and your faithfulness can be relied on eternally. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And as our Saviour taught his disciples so we pray together our father who art in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come 
your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who, who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. And to follow on from our prayers, there's a, a song, uh, well it's called, God's Spirit is in my heart, you have called me and set me apart, and this is what I have to do, and it's a wonderful song, so have a listen to that and sing along, because the lyrics are on the, on the YouTube link, and then there's Seek Ye First, the Kingdom of God, and all these things, all these things, all the things that people long for, you know, will be added to your lives as you seek put God first in your life and our, our Bible reading it's all about putting God first in our lives and taking up our cross and following Jesus and once again we're in Mark's Gospel and this week we come to what's you know what's seen as a pivot in Mark's Gospel a major turning point in Jesus's life you know up to this point Jesus has shown his power through his miracles. You know, there have been mass crowds, the feeding of the, of the thousands. And, you know, what we might describe, you and I, as a, as a successful ministry when people flocking to hear him. But from this moment on in Mark's Gospel, things change. Jesus begins his walk to suffering and to the cross. Paradoxically, it's also the road to glory. But first, the cross has to be faced and overcome. Now Jesus is geographically at the northernmost point of his ministry. And it's here though that he turns away from the adulation of the crowds in Galilee to the opposition of the authorities in Jerusalem. And we should note that the people who cheer him going into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday are people, are pilgrims from the north of the country. And then the crowd who shout crucify are those who are from the south, that's the southern end of the country, from Jerusalem. Anyway, our reading is set, that's all in the future of course, but our reading is set uh, in the place where, where Mark is very clear about where Jesus and his disciples are. They're at a place called Caesarea Philippi. Now it's a beautiful place. If you go and visit today as a pilgrim, uh, or just as a tourist, you know, it's, it's a place that is um, quiet. Uh, if you avoid all the tourists, of course. And the, it's a place where the River Jordan, one of the rivers of the river, one of the sources of the River Jordan, rises from the foot of some cliffs as a wide, slowly flowing pool. It's about 15 miles north of Lake Galilee at the foot of Mount Hermon. Now originally it was called Panaeus because the Greeks had built a temple to their god Pan in the cliff face and it was in Jesus's day it was a, a main it was on a main highway it was a center of worship of the god Pan and all kinds of idolatrous worship were there there was lots of statues set in different niches in the rock and it was so busy it was so busy people bringing goats to, to sacrifice and just a place where all the world came if you like so it was almost as if Jesus was saying to his disciples look this is what it's going to be like folks this is the world where we have to be where you were going to have to be although it wasn't until later of course that his disciples understood so in this context with lots of people worshiping a false god and offering sacrifice well this is where Jesus asked the question who do you say that I am? He and the disciples were surrounded, remember, by the statues of false gods. And so in this moment, Peter and his disciples had to decide if Jesus was for real. Or was he just like the idols and statues that surrounded them? Another false god. Now today the place is called Bernaeus because according to local folklore, people were unable to, uh, to pronounce the letter P, so they couldn't say Peneus, so they called it Bernaeus. 
at least that's what one guy told us when I was in Israel once but for the Christian for the Christian this is where Jesus asked Peter and the disciples who do you say that I am and what was Peter's answer well Matthew in Matthew's gospel tells us that Peter replied you are the Messiah the son of the living God Luke says that Peter said you are God's Messiah but in Mark's gospel Peter's answer is simply recorded as <clears throat> you are the Messiah Mark liked to keep things short simple and straight to the point so we're going to read from Mark's gospel from Mark chapter 8 and verses 27 to 38 Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi and on the way he asked his disciples who do people say that I am and they answered him John the Baptist and others Elijah and still others one of the prophets he asked them but who do you say that I am Peter answered him you are the Messiah and he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again he said all this quite openly and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him but turning and looking at his disciples he rebuked Peter and said get behind me Satan for you are setting your mind not on divine things but on human things he called the crowd with his disciples and said to them if any want to become my followers let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me for those who want to save their life will lose it and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it for what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life indeed what can they give in return for their life what can they give in return for their life it's quite something that isn't it there's a lot going on in this reading but I want to focus in on Jesus's question and the cost if you like of following Jesus now those of you who've been following the, the, the Olympics and the Paralympics you know will I'm sure I mean you're obviously very keen on sport uh, enjoying those things uh, and it's good to note isn't it that those the Olympics the Paralympics are a major event in the lives of all athletes all the training is geared towards this great event the hope is glory they're hoping for a medal but for the majority it will simply mean earning the right to be called an Olympian and the rest of us are in awe I think just of that and when the games are finally over as they are now then life for these Olympians is not the same it's never the same again because they can call themselves an Olympian and people will be well people will respect them for that now I'm sure that when you look back over your life there have been moments when when things changed and life was never the same again for you and so here in Mark's gospel this is that moment you know Jesus reveals who he is through questioning Mark through questioning Peter sorry you know Mark has built up to this moment and after it nothing is the same because the journey to the cross begins here the question on everybody's lips the question that they've all been afraid to ask has been who is this who is this man who teaches with authority, who has power over demons, who feeds thousands with just a, hand, a handful of food? Who is this man who can still the wind and the waves, who walks on water? Who is this man who heals the sick and makes the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak? Who indeed is this man? But before anyone asked, Jesus got his question in first. 
Who do you, who do you say that I am? And like all of us, Peter and the disciples had to answer. And it was Peter, of course, who answered Jesus. You, said Peter, you, Jesus, you are the Messiah. But then, of course, how did people of that day understand the word, the title, Messiah? Now, it means anointed. The name Christ, from the Greek word Christos, means the same thing. And the people of Israel would have described the Messiah as God's anointed, God's deliverer. And king and priests, kings and priests, were anointed. And by Jesus' day, people expected God's anointed one to, to come and deliver the nation from the oppressive, occupying Roman power that ruled over them. Jesus, however, saw things, unsurprisingly, in a very different way. The real oppressor in life is not a foreign political power. Foreign political powers come and they go, as, as we know, <coughs> as we've watched the terrible um, events unfolding in Afghanistan. But Jesus, for Jesus, the foreign power is the foreign power of sin that leads people into disobedience to God, that leads people away from God. Once we are overpowered by sin, then we are on the road to destruction. Now, going back to the people of Israel, they expected a king like David, like King David, who would restore Israel to its former glories, get rid of the Romans, and bring in a time of peace and prosperity for all, and restore Israel to its rightful place as the chosen people of God. They did not expect a suffering Messiah who had to die. It was on no one's agenda, except Jesus's, of course. So how do you and I, God's people, the church today, understand Jesus' words? Uh, Peter's words, sorry, about Messiah. Well, I hope that we believe that Jesus is God's anointed one, that he is God's Messiah, who through his suffering, his death and his resurrection, of course, came to deliver the whole world, not from the occupying army of the Romans, or any other occupying army for that matter, but from the powers of sin and of death. Only Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one of God, was able to pay the price of our sin so that we might receive God's forgiveness. Only Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one of God, can bring us into a right relationship with God the Father. He defeated sin, the power of sin, and ultimately sin no longer has power over us. Yes, we still sin from day to day, but... You know, we can resist sin in the power of God's Holy Spirit. And only Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One of God, can give us the promise of eternal life. He alone conquered death through his resurrection. After Jesus' death, after his resurrection, after his ascension, his return to heaven, and after Pentecost, when the disciples were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, Peter and the other disciples finally understood that to say and believe Jesus is the Messiah is to be obedient even to death. Only through sacrifice and suffering is glory achieved. Olympic athletes make incredible sacrifices, suffering in all kinds of ways to achieve glory. They're obedient to their coaches, to their trainers, you know, day in and day out, day after day, getting up early, training through the dark nights of winter in order to be an Olympian. And their reward may be the glory of a medal or the glory of being known as an Olympian. But I bet if I asked you who won a particular race or who won a particular gold medal in a particular event, very few people will be able to tell us now. That's, that's a passing glory. It's a glory that fades. And then in three years' time in Paris, hopefully, we'll do it all again. And more people will have that glory heaped upon them just for a moment. Such a sacrifice, such obedience for a fleeting, albeit glorious reward. You know, I admire these athletes greatly. And when I'm out running in the hills, you know, I can imagine myself as an Olympic athlete. It's all in the imagination, of course. 
But as I say, that's only for a passing glory. All that struggle and suffering and pain for a passing glory. There is a far greater reward, a far greater glory. The gift of life in all its fullness. Eternal life beginning here and now. To say to Jesus, you are the Messiah, is to lose your life for the sake of the gospel and for Jesus. It is to accept that a cross will need to be carried. It has to be carried. Take up your cross, says Jesus, and follow me. We have to make sacrifices in order to follow Jesus. That's the greatest decision that you or I will ever make. And as I think of our friends from Iran who fled that country because of their Christian faith, you know, they've given up so much and sacrificed so much to follow Jesus. As I say, that's the greatest, it's the most important decision we will ever make. And the wonderful truth, of course, is that when you lose your life for Jesus, you will, in the words of Jesus, save it. Save it for eternity. Suffering and glory, as for Jesus, go hand in hand. The Christian teacher, Sadhu Sundar Singh, wrote these words. It is easy to die for Christ. It is hard to live for him. Dying takes only an hour or two. But to live for Christ means to die daily. Only during the few years of this life are we given the privilege of serving each other and Christ. We shall have heaven forever, but only a short time for service here. And therefore we must not waste the opportunity. Who do you say that I am? asked Jesus. And my answer? Your answer? Our answer? Jesus, you are the Messiah. Amen. A good song to sing at this point is, of course, The Servant King. From heaven you came, helpless babe. Entered our world, your glory veiled. The one who came to die for us, to offer his life as a sacrifice, a self-sacrifice. And through that self-sacrifice, he was raised to glory, and so shall we be. And then another song, Longing for Light, We Wait in Darkness. Just that longing, that longing for God to fill our lives, to be with him. It's a real prayer, isn't it? And that leads us nicely into our prayers of in intercession as we pray for others. And as we pray, you know, as we pray today, I want to invite you just to, again, use your imagination and to, to bring pictures to mind of people and places who you want to pray for. So let us pray. As we pray, we invite you, Holy God, to transform us by your Spirit, that we may play our part in being an answer to someone's prayer today. And so we pray for people who need your love and your comfort. So as you are still, you might like to whisper a person's name, or hold a picture of a face or two in your mind as you pray. And as the music plays, bring those people into God's presence. Lord God, you know our hearts and you know our hurts. You know the names, the faces and the situations that we have brought to you. You know the people we pray for on a regular basis. You know the world and all her needs right now. And once again we pray for the people of Afghanistan. Remembering especially today the courageous women protesting in the face of, of the Taliban guns, their loss of freedom.
and as the anniversary, the 20th anniversary of 9-11 comes around once more. We again pray for all those people who lost their lives. And for all those who've lost their lives as a result of that event over the years. The peoples of Afghanistan, thousands and thousands. And the members of the armed forces who have given their lives. Lord, may your spirit move through every war-torn land and turn hate to love and war to peace. We remember all who are suffering the effects of the climate crisis through flood, fire and famine. And we pray for the meeting of the world leaders at COP26 in Glasgow in November and we will continue to pray for them as we get closer to that day. Lord we do pray for a, raise, a raising of awareness amongst all our leaders of the need to act and to act now and show us too how we can be an answer to prayer. Teach us how to be a people of grace, of justice, of life and comfort in a broken world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And here's a prayer you might like to use for yourself. It's a daily prayer of Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Dear Jesus, Help me to spread your fragrance everywhere I go. Flood my soul with your spirit and love. Penetrate and possess my whole being so utterly that all my life may only be a radiance to yours. Amen. Now to end our worship, again to songs uh, that you might like to try. The first one I want to say thanks to Cathy for, for introducing me to this. Uh, Mavis Staples, Far Celestial Shore. If you like a little bit of blues, gospel type music, you'll love this. Mavis Staples. And uh, again, it's uh, looking forward to the time of eternity, to glory with God in heaven. And then finally, there's a sound on the wing like a victory song again that overcoming of all the powers of evil and sin in the world one day that will be a reality and so the blessing be filled with the spirit of god in your hearts empowered by the holy spirit continue your walk of discipleship and faith in love and hope travel with people who need a companion today and take your next steps in faith Amen. God bless you. And uh, just a final word, a uh, final notice if you like. There won't be a recorded service next week because I'll be enjoying the wonder and the beauty of Scotland. Having a week's break. But I'll see you soon. So take care now. God bless.